In today's love-filled half-hour, 70s icon Patti Belay gets all tongue-tied when it comes to describing the love of her life. I, I, I'm trying to find a word to describe my Stephen. He is, um, ooh, he is one of the best gifts God's ever given me. Plus, I've married so many people in my dreams through the years since I've been a little girl. From probably, I think maybe John Taylor from Duran Duran, George Michael, Magnum, P.I. And obviously every wedding was just so magical and there were tears, not only from me, but the, the whole of the congregation. And I, uh, yes, I had a lot to live up to. <laughs> My first boyfriend um, was, it was in Nigeria when I was growing up and I, I, I just, I guess I just, um, I was not in love with him because I got over him like that. <laughs> when you're young, you don't know whether you're in love or not, but I think really, when I first saw Stephen, who we're married to now, I think that was when I fell in love. I mean, I, I looked at him and I thought, ah, he's too polished. And I thought, gosh, what a gorgeous looking man. There was something shy about him. There was something gentle. And he was, ooh, he looked like an angel. <laughs> so I guess it was love. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're in good voice. And I know you've got your dancing shoes on. All I need is for you to be my backing singers. called Black Mikado, and he owned the theater with Larry Barnes. Um, I didn't know who owned the theater at the time, wasn't interested. <laughs> so I didn't even know the theater was owned by anybody. So um, I, it was, we were doing a rehearsal, and he came and introduced himself. This shy man came up to me and said, um, we're doing a recording with an actress called uh, Anushka Hempel, I think her name was. And he said, and, um, the recording is not going very well. We're looking for somebody to put a voice on uh, and would like you to do it. And I thought, okay. And he said, well, uh, you know, I'll pick you up after, you know, and, and we will discuss. Uh, I'll tell you about the recording. I said, fine, okay, okay. So he picks me up um, and takes me to the Dorchester Hotel. How oh, to impress. We talked about the recording and everything and on the taxi, dropping me home to my flat, because I, I had a flat in Chelsea. He said to me, will you marry me? I went, oh, 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 I've got to write one here. Cuckoo. Do you have take two. We had to work together, record together. And then at the time, I found out he was married had four children, and um, you know, so I just thought, okay, this is Joker. But it, it's really strange because we sort of, we grew closer. I mean, I had to see him all the time because we were recording. He was in the studio all the time, and he was always shy, he was quiet. But you know, he would, if I needed to be picked up, he'll be the one to pick me up and, and take me to the studio, and he'll be the one to drop me off at the studio. It's funny because we it sort of developed into an affair, which I'm ashamed to say it developed into an affair. And a lot of people were hurt along the way. His wife gave him an ultimatum, obviously, quite rightly. And he said, I think maybe I should just, you know, give my marriage another. I said, it's a wise idea. Because, I mean, I said to you, listen, I am African. You don't know anything about me. You don't know anything about my customs. You don't know, you know, I mean, you just... And, and uh, two weeks without him, without seeing him, absolute hell, absolute hell. But he came back one day, just turned up in my flat, and said, can't do it. 
I said, can't do it. I, I'm sorry, I have to be with you, can't do it. And I, I said to him, oh gosh, no. I said, I don't know, you're making a mistake here. Because I was worried, I am very young. And I thought, well, I was in my 20s. I was, you know, actually just coming to 20. I thought, oh, how do, you know, panic. So I said to him, okay. He said, no, I want to marry you. And I said, oh, mistake. You have to speak to my mother. You have to get my mother's opinion. You, my, you have to get my mother's approval. You have to, I said, you, you crazy. I said, there's a pyramid behind me. You see me, there are hundreds of people. I have an extended family. And I said, by the time they all finish with you, I'm sure you want to go back to your wife. <laughs> my mother came to visit. And I said to him, he said, well, just give me what good point do I have that I could. He said, I'm twice married, four children in tow, white. He said, what exactly are my good points? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, you just have to. I said, she's a very wise woman. She has eight children. I'm number seven, you know, and the eight, well, number six, because we lost one. I said, so she will, whatever she says, said, but what if she doesn't like me? I said, we have a very long engagement. <laughs> and my dear husband, Dear Stephen then, he came to see my mother. He was white as sheets. I've never seen anyone so nervous, you know. And they spent two hours, two hours. I thought, what are they doing? So I thought, well, give them time. When he finally came out, I said, how'd he go? He said, oh, you've been sold to me lock, stock, and barrel. Stephen being white and me being black was, people had, some people had problems with that, you know, uh, we, we didn't. I mean, my stepdaughters were wonderful. My stepdaughters were absolutely fantastic. As a matter of fact, funny enough, my husband's first mother-in-law was, I mean, everybody thought she was my mother-in-law. She was just wonderful. She loved me. She, I'm totally, I'm, 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 she adopted me. And for us, it was no problem. I think because of the way Stephen, Stephen really didn't see anything else, Stephen. Because Stephen was brought up in Singapore when he was little. He was the only white boy in a Chinese school. So he understands the race thing, being different. But he didn't. The thing I loved about him, there was no white, black thing. And um, people, other people had a problem with him, but who cares? I was touring when Stephen proposed to me, and I had a wonderful, wonderful PR man called Richard Laver. And we said, okay, Richard, you handle the arrangement. I got a call from Richard, and he said, now, what color flowers do you want for tomorrow? Because I, I ordered the flowers, but I just want to make sure I've done the right thing. And flowers, tomorrow. What do you need flowers for, Richard? He said, for your wedding. I went, wedding? Tomorrow? What? What? Tomorrow? He said, yes, Patty. He said, don't tell me. No dress. So Patty drove all the way to New Bond Street, 5.30, shops were closing. And I went to a place, there was a shop called Christina there. And she was just closing, I went, please, please, please open the door, please, please. She went, put my hand away. I said, please, I'm getting married tomorrow. This is September. I said, I'm getting married tomorrow. I don't care what you have, anything light colored, cream, anything, please. She went. You're getting married. I said, please, I swear, I'm getting married tomorrow. And when I came in, she spent an hour. The woman was lovely. She spent an hour. She was talking to me because she could not believe I was really getting married the next day. And I didn't have my wedding dress. Yeah. So I had this simple cream dress, which was, you know, kind of woolly. And as God will have it, 15 years later, we got married in the church. So I got out a big dress. That, again, I had everything planned in two weeks. We had about 250 people at the church wedding. And then, um, that was quite nice. That was really lovely. I, I sort of tried very hard. I couldn't do the white blancmange dress thing. So I did a cream blancmange dress thing, which I designed myself. And I made my headgear myself. I had kind of this turban. I looked like 
Genghis Khan. <laughs> And I used to love beading. So I beaded the, the, the hat, and it's kind of like a turban. It looked like a, looked like a mask, actually, <laughs> like the top of a mask. Anyway, it was fun. It was my wedding day, and I was getting married. I wasn't nervous. I was getting married to a man I love so much. OK, guys, let's finish it off now. Woo! Many years ago, I had um, you know how children write letters to Santa Claus? Well, I had in mind the kind of husband I wanted and wrote it down in a letter to God. Dear God, that's how it started. <laughs> when I get married, I want a man who is, I had a whole list. The only thing I didn't mention was the color. And I tell you, when I found the paper years later, Stephen ticked off all the list. I mean, who says prayers doesn't get answered? He's gentle, he is kind, he is the most considerate person, he is my best friend. I, I, I'm trying to find a word to describe my Stephen. He is, um, ooh, he is one of the best gifts God's ever given me. Still to come. I was chatting to him afterwards and I said, I know you, Chris, from somewhere. And it transpired that I used to do the weather, present the weather on his uh, radio show on BBC London 10 years before that. But it was always down the line, so I never actually saw his face. I've married so many people in my dreams through the years since I've been a little girl. From probably, I think maybe John Taylor from Duran Duran, George Michael, Magnum, P.I. Um, and obviously every wedding was just so magical and there were tears, not only for me, but the, the whole of the congregation. And I, uh, yes, I had a lot to live up to. <laughs> The first love of my life was Roger Checkley, who sadly moved to Australia when I was about six or seven. But I remember having a kiss from him when I was in primary school, and it was just wonderful. I think he'd kissed most of the girls in his class, uh, and I was probably one of the last. And then he obviously left not only the country, but the continent. Okay, I met my husband, Chris Hawkins, in a nightclub. I was there on my own. I was seeing a band. This was about, oh, about six or seven years ago now. And I recognised the name and the voice, but I didn't know where from. And I was standing on my own, just about to see this band, and he sent over a glass of champagne, which obviously was the right thing to do. And I was chatting to him afterwards, and I said, I know you, Chris, from somewhere. And it transpired that I used to do the weather, present the weather on his uh, radio show on BBC London 10 years before that, but it was always down the line, so I never actually saw his face. And that was just unbelievable. We hadn't spoken to each other probably for about six years because it was all on air. Uh, and then we started dating a few months after that, and he proposed within four or five months. So it was a real quick sort of dating and getting all over and done with. I just, I knew what I wanted basically. And he sort of ticked all the right boxes. We bumped into each other quite a lot during the first few months. We were introduced via Jamie Cullen's artist manager, who uh, obviously thought we'd be a good pairing. And he was right. So I bumped into him at a Jamie Cullen concert at Pizza Express. And then I saw him again at another gig. And it was, it was, we kept, you know, it was just really nice to say, oh God, Chris, lovely to see you. And eventually he mustered up the courage to invite me out on a date. And we went to Ronnie Scott's, which was fabulous. It's a jazz club in London. And it just went from there and it blossomed. But I did say from the very start, once we started dating, I, you know, I'm not messing around with this sort of three or four years of dating. I'm up for this. So I want total 100% commitment from you. wanted somebody who was more organized than I was. I wanted a man who was younger than me. Someone obviously was really, took pride in his work, but also his appearance. And I was a bit of a house husband on the quiet as well. I needed someone who would be able to organize my finances for me, but somebody who was fun and had a really good sense of humor. I should have said that first, I know, but there was, there was a lot of things which I, I needed. And in a way, I, in my mind's eye, I knew exactly what I was looking for. And Chris, at the time, did actually, he, it was amazing. He did tick all the right boxes. So for me, I, I knew that he was the one for me. I, Christopher Charles Hawkins, take
make you Claire Lynn Nazir to be my wife. I, Christopher Charles Hawkins, take you Claire Lynn Nasir to be my wife. He was different from the previous people I dated because he was he was more interested in me than, than, than himself, which was great. He asked lots of different questions. And one thing I liked about him when we were sitting um, across a dinner table, he would mimic my facial expressions, which I thought was so endearing. And it just showed that he had some interest in me rather than some men just want to talk about themselves, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was, he was great. And all my friends really loved him. He's quite cute and cuddly. Um, obviously, you know, as time progressed, you, you find out more about the person. And the more I found out about him, the more I liked him. Chris proposed to me six months after we started dating, and it was in a little pub in Wiltshire. He knows I'm a bit of stickler for history and geography, so in a beautiful area of the countryside, in the room Samuel Pepys used to write his diaries. So that was just wonderful. But it was Friday the 13th of February, so he had to wait till after midnight to propose. And so it was one minute after midnight. By, by then I was tired, I was in my pyjamas, ready for bed. It wasn't very romantic, and he had champagne waiting for me downstairs in a beautiful 12th century courtyard and it took a while for him to persuade me to go down in my pajamas but it was wonderful when he did propose and then we had a year to organize the, the whole wedding now I am NOT a, a, a someone who organizes anything I'm not particularly organized that's why I do weather it's all about chaos and I love chaos Chris is particularly organized so we decided to hire a wedding coordinator which was the best thing we ever did to be honest now it was going to cost us but at least we were going to save because he was gonna, she was going to get us discount on things but not only that she was somebody we could rant at rather than each other. So we hired someone called Siobhan Craven Robbins, who we absolutely love and who's become one of my best friends. She had done some work for GMTV, so I had been working with her with the interactive weddings we'd done on the show. So I had a taste of what she was like, and she's very calm, and Chris really likes her, which was really important. So we spent the, the first few months planning what style of wedding we wanted. And the style we wanted was something, well, I wanted, actually, was something really au naturel. We want, I wanted to get married in early spring. Uh, where we weren't dependent on the weather. We knew it was going to be cold and probably a bit windy or grey. But I wanted everything to almost life reappearing again. So uh, I wanted uh, flowers which were from a woodland. I wanted to look like I'd just come out of a, a little forest. Something slightly medieval and something really fresh. And so that's what happened. My wedding dress was designed by someone called Hayley Jay. She's based in Shropshire. And it was a two-piece. It was a beautiful, very simple, straight dress with a beautiful uh, white chiffon-y uh, coat over the top with a hood. Uh, lots of embroidery and, and very elegant and just created a really nice line. A lovely, beautiful long trail with the embroidered, our embroidered initials on the back, on the bottom. It was absolutely stunning and I absolutely loved it. As part of the dress, um, I had lots of tiny little crystals in the dress which were slightly turquoise which reflected the colour of the bridesmaids, which was a Tiffany blue. And I had a headdress, head jewellery piece, which I had made especially in white gold and little crystals coming down of turquoise. It's absolutely stunning. The day itself was absolutely incredible. It was all in central London. We had a beautiful church wedding next door to where we lived. And then we hired three double-decker buses and took everyone down to Cafe Royal. Uh, in all, there were 400 people there. We had a big band, 12-piece jazz band, and then my brother's band played later on. Our first dance was Yellow. Coldplay. That was the first gig we'd ever been to together and it was just the most wonderful day. It really was. We had a nice sculpture with our, our initials, a, a free bar and loads of scrumptious food. And then we took off at five in the morning to Barbados. And I think people, our guests, really loved it. They said it was a brilliant wedding. But I think there was something everyone um, was sort of caught up with the magic of the, of the, of the evening. As people were leaving at sort of two, three in the morning, we all gave them all daffodils because obviously it's early season, so there were daffs everywhere. And so everyone left Cafe Royal onto Regent Street with all these daffodils. It's just fabulous. It's really good. So the day itself and the evening itself was exactly how Chris and I wanted it. Chris was wearing a beautiful top hat and tails with a cravat in the same colour as my bridesmaids. The problem with the bridesmaids, I wanted about 12, 13, 14, all my friends, but I couldn't have that, so I chose my relatives instead. So I had Chris's two sisters and three of my cousins. And they were in this stunning, very shimmery, sort of Tiffany blue uh, dresses. They were very long, they were strapless, and I wanted my bridesmaids to look sexy. 
I didn't want them to feel flouncy. I wanted them to feel like they would could strut their stuff on the dance floor and have a snog with the, one of the ushers if, if needs be. We had five gorgeous ushers as well, my three brothers and some of Chris's cousins and one of his best friends. So they're in, in effect, it was a family affair. But all my best friends were there and, and everyone else, the world and his wife, to be honest. So from our point of view, it was just a day to remember. Celeb-wise, we had all my best friends there. So obviously Kate Garraway, who would have been a bridesmaid if I'd been cho choosing friends as bridesmaids. Carla Romano, who again looked absolutely stunning in a beautiful uh, designer dress. Then we had Andrew McLean, who always is the most prettiest girl on the block. She really is. Uh, every, the, the, the whole dress code was, the dress code was black tie. So everyone had a chance to wear DJs or big ball gowns if they wanted to. And that really was a, a good choice. I mean, John Stapleton and Lynn Folds were a wonderful couple and we were very close to both Chris and I. Looked just stunning. Lynn was in lacy black. John was obviously in his DJ with a Man City coloured uh, dicky bow. Uh, so that was just great. And then some of Chris's colleagues were there from Radio 6 Music as well. So to be honest, they were good people. Jane Middlemas came along and she's a really good friend of Chris. So she's done a lot of radio with, with Chris. And, um, and they were all friends. We didn't hire celebs for the occasion, but they were people there who we really, really wanted to be there. Chris and I have been married for a few years now and we are probably stronger than we when we first met. We've learnt to live with each other's sort of strangenesses and, and Chris has got quite a few and so have I. But uh, as the years have gone on, it's got better and better. Uh, Chris and I live very strange hours but we live them together and that's a really important thing. We eat together every evening, we sit down, we turn the television off and we talk to each other. We, we relax together, we enjoy the same programs and we share the same friends. I think that's m really important. He hasn't become a stranger in my life despite the fact that both of us have got very, very busy jobs, um, quite hectic jobs. Next time, Crossroads actress Cindy Marshall Day reveals her criteria when it comes to men. I've never been that bothered about how good looking they are. Um, but kindness is really important and obviously they've got to they've you know they've got to be sort of um, I mean they can't be a, a pauper or anything. Plus the Bills Burnside, Chris Ellison and his wife Anita on their first meeting. He just kept staring at me, staring at me, staring at me, and I went into the kitchen thinking, Well she stop staring for God's sake. I, I thought there was something wrong. There it was. was just... You had a bit of cabbage in your tea. <laughs> <laughs>